Thank you. I, uh, I'm not sure if I can see this under here. <laughs> I may have to be wander out there. <laughs> well, we'll try it. Um, I got to point out a few pictures here because every one of these pictures uses photovoltaics and has been a focus of NASA programs on in, in all of these cases. Uh, the space station, which you see right there, uh, has will have the largest solar powered uh, ever in space by the time of its final construction. And uh, that has 262,000 single crystal silicon solar cells that look just like this. And I'll pass this around so you get a chance to see it. They're laid out on a little plastic blanket with copper interconnects. And if you use a little imagination here, you'll find you can match up the backside contacts with the pattern on this Kapton polyimid structure. You have four laser drilled holes through this, so if you hold it up to the light, you'll see the four holes, and the contacts are wrapped through those holes on the cell to the back side. So you've got essentially, when this is in sunshine, you've got the equivalent of a battery with a plus side and a minus side. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as the day progresses. Now you might wonder a little bit about what a blimp is doing there. <laughs> it's an airship and there is a lot of interest currently in NASA in looking at these kinds of powered airships for upper atmospheric studies. Now it's a lot of real estate. This thing is huge. Um, just imagine rolling out a solar cell blanket on top of it to use as power for the airship. And we've done a lot of work uh, actually looking at the application for that particular case. And believe it or not, we've actually flown this. It's an entirely electric aircraft. It is powered by cells on the top wings, and these are electric motors that actually provide the thrust necessary for the aircraft. Um, the motivation for that, well, there's several mo motivations for that. Again, upper atmospheric research where they can have this stay up. If you use it in conjunction with a fuel cell, for example, where you have some storage, you can envision leaving it up for quite a long time. We are now at NASA, according to the President's program as he announced it in 2004, we are going back to the moon. Of course, the president's changing. Who knows what the next one will do? Uh, <laughs> but we've been investigating how we would power ourselves if we established a base on the moon. Now, of course, you know that the moon has a few problems for solar power. It's dark half the time, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what you can do is in fact you can put things at the poles where you can get sunlight for the entire time. And last but not least, we'd like to go back to Mars. And I will spend a little bit of time talking about that. We have some studies that our group is doing on the Mars rovers, um, previously on the Pathfinder rover that landed in 1997. And also one of our scientists is working with the current Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, that are still, believe it or not, roaming the planet uh, four years after their uh, landing in 2004, and what was theoretically a 90-day mission. Okay, so okay, they got that one wrong. Well, I, we'll come back to why they got that one wrong in a few minutes. What is more recent is our departure into the terrestrial world. We now have, and this is under construction as we speak, 
A concentrating system, that's, this is the photovoltaic research building right behind this uh, uh, picture here. This will be a 900x concentration. It has vertical junction silicon solar cells on this little bar here that will power it. It is water cooled and then the cooling water will theoretically run back into the building's heat power. This is grid interconnected with the building and so whatever electricity we generate we will be and we will either use or essentially sell back to the grid. This array, look at the top one, that's a modern array. It's only been at Glenn Research Center now for a little over a year. Um, it is a two kilowatt polycrystalline silicon cell array and it is just grid tied into the building behind it um, to provide power again for the building and if there is excess back to the utility. The bottom arrays here, this was a photovoltaic test bed that was built in the 1970s. These are Arco solar panels, crystalline silicon. Each of these panels, just take one little slice here, is 4.3 watts. These panels are 20 watts. And I guess I got to touch it and wake it back up again. Come back, come back. Ooh, it's sleeping. Hmm. Strange. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> Interesting arrangement. That's coming up on your heater. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite, there it is, it came back. This, these terrestrial rays are a result of a presidential mandate. Mind you, another one of those federally unfunded mandates that they put out often to the educational world. Uh, they have now put out for NASA. NASA is the single largest, well the government I guess not just NASA, but the government as a whole is the single largest user of electricity in the country. And so there has been an edict uh, given by the uh, president that we will turn green, right? Of course the problem is we have no way to fund these systems. So little by little we're putting them up when we can get the resources to do so. So this two kilowatt array rec represents an effort that NASA is making as an agency to become a little more green and environmentally conscious. So having said all that, let's go more specifically to the solar cell. Now, it won't hurt you. It's a little bit of math, <laughs> but if you look at a solar cell, if you look at it in the dark, it acts like a diode. If you look at it in the light, what you have is the interaction of the light with the semiconductor such that excitons are formed. Excitons are bound electron and whole pairs. Now, there is an asymmetry in the construction of this PN diode, if you will, and that is quite simply the fact that if you look at silicon here on the chart, you will see that if you put a little bit of boron in silicon, Boron has one less electron than silicon, and you can make a p-type semiconductor. If you put one more electron by using phosphorus in silicon, you can make an n-type semiconductor. <laughs> 